Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's May 4th. Uh, Supervisor Johnson, are you on the telephone? Yes. Okay, thank you and good morning. Um, I'd like to start out this meeting this morning with the invocation of the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please join me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here today. Our thoughts and prayers go out to those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic here in Mojave County and the state of Arizona, as well as the nation. Guide us in our decisions today. Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board of Supervisors may by motion recess into executive session to receive legal advice from the board's attorney on any item contained in this agenda pursuant to ARS 34431.03. At this time, I'll entertain a motion and action to call for an executive session to be held on May the 4th, 2020 at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance to ARS 38431.03. So moved. <coughs> Second the motion. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. I'll entertain a motion and action to approve waiving the reading in full of items presented for discussion, adoption, or approval at this meeting. So moved. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. So we'll <coughs> go on to the official business to come before the board this morning. We'll start out with discussion or pending or contemplated litigation claims and demands. Attorney Esplin. Good morning, nothing to report to the board, thank you. That's good news. Okay. Uh, committee and or legislative reports. Supervisor Johnson, we'll start out with you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to take a moment to recognize uh, Eric Burks from IT, he completed the NACO Enterprise Cybersecurity Leadership Academy. You know, there's only 400 uh, nationwide have completed this program. I think it's really good for okay. the county. Supervisor and for Johnson, IT. Can, can I interrupt real quick? We, we can't hear you. Uh, if we can get IT to turn up the volume. Okay. Uh, How about now? Yeah, yeah. You sound great now. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right, I'd like to start off by uh, recognizing Eric Burks. He, he's from our IT. He completed the NACO Enterprise Cybersecurity Leadership Academy. Only 400 people nationwide have completed this program so far. I think it's really good for our department and obviously good for Eric. And then on a sad note, I would also ask for a moment of silence for Pat Chastain, our former clerk of the board who has passed away she was always professional in her duties, kept the board running smoothly, uh, even through some, tough, every, through some tough times that we had. And we had a Western Regional Partnership meeting. Uh, WRP is gonna drill down and work on water issues and water security in the region during 2020 calendar year. They did not go into details, but essentially serve as an introduction to the subject. One aspect of the meeting was to not let go of last year's theme, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, as it was on the phone, they cut it short. We had a meeting on the management oversight group. It was obviously originally planned to be in person in Las Vegas with Fish and Wildlife Service, but they changed their mind. The biggest news from the two hour long agenda was meeting that this year's monitoring program was canceled due to the COVID-19 virus. They said for reasons too numerous to mention was the official statement from the Fish and Wildlife Supervisor. Monitoring was not part of the agenda and under ordinary circumstances, field crews would be at work right now doing work on one half of the tortoise conservation areas. Uh, we pressed them on that and they kind of ducked the question but said they didn't 
feel they needed to go out into the field because of the COVID virus. Um, there was discussion about the NEPA consideration of the highway fencing. The analysis is continuing. The plan of fencing occurs exclusively on the interstate highways across four states. It did begin as California only, but the management oversight group expanded the review, analysis, and documentation to fencing in all four Mojave states. Ali Zhang from the University of Reno, Nevada, presented a comprehensive review of Raven study. It was an extended presentation of a paper she had presented at the Desert Tortoise Council meeting in February. Much of the data related to nesting behaviors, but the key parts of the paper related to where to undertake egg oiling, <laughs> the expectation of maximum effectiveness for reducing tortoise predation from ravens, the pellet studies showing raven food habits preference in the critical habitat units. Her work was limited to California, despite her Nevada base. No area lacked evidence of tortoises being part of the diet. Uh, the highest mortality rate from ravens was in the Chukawala area with 20% um, predation. With all the power lines, Chukawala has a relatively high tortoise population and also has the remote MWD power line, which services this pumping station. It also likely has the least amount of raven food subsidies from communities, roadkill, agriculture like pistachio orchards, and trash disposal, leaving ravens to find food from residential fauna. Uh, that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Supervisor Johnson. Uh, <laughs> Supervisor Gold. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I attended the Workforce Development Board meeting telephonically, um, got some good reports. We got a great report from uh, Tammy Ursenbaugh, and it, that, which I thought it might be interesting to have Tammy make a monthly report to the board on her activities, or at least your activities that she can share, because some of those activities are confidential. But um, all, it was a, actually meeting moved quickly, uh, usually a lot, three hours for the meeting, and I think they were done in about an hour and 15 minutes. That is all. Thank you, Mel. Okay, Supervisor Angus. I have nothing this morning, thanks. And Supervisor Watson. No report this morning, thank you. Okay, uh, going on to the county manager's report. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, I hope during this, this time uh, that we're in that uh, people take the opportunity to find some humor in their day. Um, I received an email from the Arizona Association of C Civil Engineering Companies and they wanted to remind everybody that uh, uh, today is Star Wars Day and may the 4th be with you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's uh, not an engineer joke, but it was... Uh Humorous, thank you for that. Okay, at this point, I will ask for a motion for approval of the March 2nd, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Going on to the call to the public. The in-person call to the public portion of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors meeting has been suspended for the time being. However, comments can be submitted to the clerk of the board no later than 5 p.m. on Friday prior to the board meeting. Um, Madam Clerk, do you have any call to the public that we need to read? Madam Chair, I have one um, submission that fell under the call to the public. All the rest of the submissions fell under the COVID-19 item and the board has been supplied with a copy of each of those submissions. Um, the one call to the public that I received was from Lex Warner. 3643 North Elgin, 86413. His comment was, I would like to know if the Board of Supervisors would show their solidarity with their constituents and give back 20% of salary reimbursements and other income perks to the county in order to relieve the financial burden of the government. Okay, thank you very much. Going on to the 
consent agenda. The following items listed under consent agenda will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion of said items unless a board member so requests. In that event, the item will be removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and action. Uh, Supervisor Johnson, do you wish to pull any item? Nothing, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gold. None today, Madam Chairman. Supervisor Angus. Not a thing. And Supervisor Watson. You're 100%. All right. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve items 5 through 53 on the consent agenda. <clears throat> so moved. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> motion passes. Uh, we did have one person. No, never mind. We'll go on to the public hearings. Item number 54, I'll open the public hearing for a discussion of possible action. Fiscal year 2020 community development blocks CDBG and fiscal year 2020 and 2021 community development block grant state special project. Uh, there's no action required on this item. Um, we're just open it up to public comments and I don't see that we have anyone that wants to speak on this. So I'll close the public meeting. I'll close the public meeting on this and go on to 54B, discussion on possible action, adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-059, authorizing the submission of applications for fiscal year 2020 state community development block grant funds. I make a motion that we approve item 54B. Second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item number 55, I'll open the public hearing. This will be a discussion and action to approve the adoption of the Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-064, a revision to acreage of London Bridge RV Resort Track 3713. I have no one signed up to speak on this item, so I'll close the public hearing and open it up to discussion or a motion. I have a motion to approve item 55. Motion to approve by Supervisor Angus. Second the motion. Second by Supervisor Watson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item 56, I'll open the public hearing. This will be a discussion and action to approve the adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-065. This will be an amendment to the Mojave County General Plan from HR land use designation to GC land use designation and an amendment to the Desert Hills fire area plan. I do not have any speakers signed up for this item, so the public hearing is now closed and I'll open up for discussion or possible motion. Madam Chairman. Supervisor Gold. I move that item 56 be adopted. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item 57, I'll open the public hearing. This will be a discussion and action to approve the adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-066. This will be a rezone for an indoor RV and boat storage facility in the Lake Havasu City vicinity. I have no one signed up to speak on this item. I'll close the public hearing and open it up to discussion or a motion. Madam Chairman. Supervisor Gold. I move that item 57 be adopted. <clears throat> Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item number 58, I'll open the public hearing. Discussion of possible action. Ray approved the adoption of the Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-067. Special use permit for a cottage industry to allow for gravel sales in the Golden Valley vicinity. I have one person signed up to speak in favor of this. Um, she is the property owner and the applicant. So uh, she's here if you want to speak, uh, Ms. Zimmerman, or, or just be here for questions. It's up to you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, having no one else signed up to speak, I'll close the public hearing, open this up for discussion or motion. Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion to uh, adopt and approve Board Resolution 2020067 for special use permit. Okay, we have a motion and I will make the second on that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. <laughs> Item number 59, I'll open the public hearing. This will be a discussion of possible action Ray approved the adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-068, an amendment to the mechanical area plan for a suburban residential land use designation to an urban commercial industrial land use designation. I do have a person signed up to speak on this. Laura Schaefer. Just for questions. Okay, you're the applicant. Okay, thank you, Laura. So I'll close the um, public hearing on this item and open it up for a motion or discussion. Uh, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gold. I move that item 59 be adopted. <coughs> I'll second the motion. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hey, okay, Laura, thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, item number 60. I'll open the public hearing. This will be a discussion of possible action. Ray, approval of the adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2020-069, a rezone for development of multifamily dwellings. Um, this will be in the Golden Valley area off south of McConnell Road. I have no one signed up to speak on this item, so I'll close the public hearing. You are right. Let me let me go back then. I have not closed the public hearing, and we'll hear now from Danny right Merskale, Mersal, Mersal. Okay. Okay, and then after him, we'll have Victor Morgan. <laughs> it's okay. We've been going pretty fast here, so we can we can take a, a moment to catch our breath yeah. like a Trump train Good morning, if you'd just give us your name and uh, tell us what's on your... It's really bad, I can't hear you. Uh, oh, hopefully we can hear you. I'm sorry? I said hopefully we can hear you. Okay, uh, I think you'll be able to hear me, I probably won't be able to hear you. Okay. My name's Victor Morgan, uh, 3230 McConaco Road. Uh, I'm here to oppose the rezoning of the section Oatman Road and McConaco Road to a multi-family residence as I understand it. Uh, it's my belief that uh, that's really, I'm assuming it's gonna be an apartment complex just from the description. I don't really think that's an apartment type area. It's a, it's a rural residential area and I, uh, the traffic and I believe it'll be more crime and uh, I just don't think it fits in that area. There's a lot more places to, to put a building like that. 
I also speak for another person that's a resident on McConnell Road that wasn't able to be here today. So there, there's more than just me. So anyway, I don't know what else to say. So that I lived that address for about 16 years now and, and it took me over a year of living in Kingman to decide where I wanted to buy and that was that area and I don't think that's a change for the better in that area. So I think that's about it. Danny, how close do you live to this area? Uh, from Oban Road, uh, it's less than a mile. I'm down toward the end of McConaughey Road before you get to Apache, but uh, that's the main entrance and out, uh, exit of that neighborhood on my road, McConaughey Road. And so that's gonna be a, a traffic problem and uh, um, I'm assuming it's, you know, rentals are a lot, I feel a lot of uh, temporary residents and uh, I think that's gonna cause a, more of a crime problem in, the, in that area. So it's just, uh, my belief from graduating from the School of Hard Knocks and being in other places like that and being around this stuff, so it's human nature, so I'm opposed. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the speaker? And the next speaker is Danny Marcel. Do we have another speaker? No, he's, uh, he had another appointment. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and open this up for discussion and or a motion. Do we have a motion? Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion for discussion. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Do we have a second? Okay, go ahead. Uh, location of this property is west of Oatman Road, but south of McConaughey Road. The gentleman that just spoke <coughs> indicated that he was close to, or just a little less than a mile away. And my question to you, because I believe it's in your district, is uh, uh, wouldn't there be a pretty good uh, requirement for the number of uh, residents and living conditions for those industries that are moving to that location? I believe that uh, planning and zoning would require a site plan and um, it, in driving past and looking at the property myself, it looks like the uh, the entrance and the exit would, could be from, from either Highway 66 or from the other road. So um, I, I think there would be several ways to get into this complex, but without seeing a site plan, um, I don't know what the intentions well, are. My question to you is, do you see a requirement for additional housing in that area due to the new businesses that are coming into the area? Yes, yeah, so, uh, the county's in dire need of affordable housing and smaller housing, and this would fit that bill. Thank you. In that case, I'll make a motion for approval. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Going on to item 61, I'll open the public hearing. Discussion and action reference uh, approval of adoption for Board of Supervisor Resolution 2020-070 to rescind and cause the property to revert from a CMO zone to the previous C2 zone as requested by the applicant and having not met the conditions of approval as specified in Board of Supervisors Resolution 2005-051. I do not have anyone signed up to speak on this item, so I'll open it up for discussion and or a motion. Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion to rescind. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion to rescind and a second. In fact, we have two seconds. Mm -hmm. Double second. We'll take the- um, I defer. The second uh, from Supervisor Gold. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay. Item 62, I'll open the public hearing. 
discussion and action, Ray, to consider adjusting and memorializing the fee schedule for Mojave County franchises and licenses for county right-of-way occupation. Uh, we have no speakers on this item. I'll open it up for discussion and or a motion. Motion for approval. You have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes and that concludes our open public hearings. We'll go down to the regular agenda. Under Ken Cunningham, the Human Resource Director, this will be item 63, a discussion and action to extend the Mojave County Personnel Policies and Procedures, Section 3.5, Attendance Policy during the influenza and or viral pandemic outbreaks until June 1st, 2020, or until such a time as the board rescinds that <coughs> authorization. Okay, Mr. Cunningham is in the audience. If anybody has any discussion or questions. I make a motion to approve item 63. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second the motion. And a second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Next item is under the Information Technology Director, Nathan McDaniels. This will be a discussion and action ray except the 2019 Mandatory Cybersecurity <coughs> Awareness Training Campaign Reports. Okay. Mr. McDaniels is coming forward if anybody has any questions or discussion. I do, Madam Chair. Okay, Supervisor Johnson, go ahead. Um, Mr. McDaniels, in December when these tests were supposed to be completed, did we have over 200 employees that hadn't completed it? Morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Supervisor Johnson, uh, on December 24th, when I generated that report prior to the end of the year, we had approximately 125 employees that had not completed. If you look at the report, uh, some people are listed three times. That's because when we prescribed training, there were three different classes. So the report basically shows a person in every class. So a person could be listed three times if they didn't complete any of the classes. Okay, and then you extended it because people were not taking the test. And as of the extended date, how many people have not taken the test? The extended date was uh, extended to April 30th. And as of this point in time, there's 16 people that are still incomplete for various reasons. Some of those people are volunteers. Some of them don't work for the county anymore. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's reasons why some people don't get it finished, but I would say at this point in time, we're 98% complete. And I think that's a fantastic achievement considering this is the first time we use this platform to facilitate the training. Okay, well, well, you think it's a great, uh, great um, result. I, I have my doubts on that because Everything is connected to cybersecurity in our county. All the security that we have, every program that we have, I think the board needs to look at not allowing people to extend the time and to revoke privileges to computers to people who not take these tests. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Does anyone else have any questions of Nathan? Okay, I don't believe we need a motion on, on this. But, uh, Mad Madam Chair, it is agendized to accept the report, but technically you don't have to take action. Okay. Up to you. All right, we'll take no action. Okay, the next item, 65, is under Cindy Landa Cox, our Mojave County Treasurer. This will be a discussion and action related to the report from the Mojave County Treasurer's Office and Mojave County Sheriff's Office regarding any uncollected personal property taxes broken down by supervisor district. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Supervisor Angus. I was just confused as to um, what we're supposed to do with that information. Hey, is Cindy Landa Cox? Okay. Ah, there we go. Oh. We have a representative of uh, the treasurer's office. 
Good morning, Chairman Bishop, Supervisors. Luke Mornian, Acting Chief Deputy Treasurer. Uh, I believe Supervisor Johnson is the one that requested this information, so I believe he would need to answer that question, Supervisor Angus. And Supervisor Johnson, do you have any comment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, it's for Supervisor Angus, I don't really care about Supervisor Districts. What I'm interested in, if you go to the Group D, Mr. Moynihan has been kind enough to put this in a very good order. As we all know, personal property taxes are due and payable on a certain date. There's no grace period. So when we're serving these papers, we should be serving them immediately because- Has joined the conference. This, per this personal property can disappear rather quickly. We have some that are delinquent 17 years, 15 years, 13 years, 12 years, et cetera. I think we need to make sure that the collections are taking place in a timely manner, which would mean the day they're received is when we start collecting them, not years later. We have a ton of them that are, maybe not a ton, but a lot of them are just one year old. But if you go through the list, you'll see three year old, four year old. Um, I'm just curious why these aren't being collected in a timely manner. And maybe, I don't know if this would be the appropriate time with the attorney, but to make a motion that we immediately go after the personal property taxes that are due and delinquent. That's all, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Do you have any comment to that, Luke? I, I do not. We, we send notices to the sheriff's office per statute. There's also delinquent tax bills that are generated at the same time that information is passed off to the sheriff's office uh, who is tasked with the collection of those delinquent personal property taxes. Uh, the delinquent tax statements are mailed out by our IT department to the taxpayers, to their address of record. Uh, after that, it's, it's basically in the sheriff's hands to commence any sort of collection, collection actions. And as you can see in the, in, the, in the data that we did provide, there was just over, I think it was 1,084 parcels uh, that were delinquent as of the end of calendar 2019. And as of April 15th, about 55% of those had been collected in full. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chairman. Supervisor Gold. Um, Luke, how many of these properties are mobile homes? The vast majority, Supervisor Gold, are mobile homes. There's a few of them that are business, personal property, but the vast majority are mobile homes. And mobile homes mean that they're, they predate 1986? No, I don't, I don't believe that would be correct. Because if it's a manu, I guess you could have a manufactured home that didn't have a notice of a fixed, a fixture, and then it would be personal property. But I'm assuming a lot of these are run down mobile homes that we would actually be, if we were to seize them, we would be abating the nuisance rather than hauling the, hauling the trailer off. Supervisor Gold, based on, based on the information we get from the sheriff's office when they do request abatement, that would be correct. Most, most of the times these are, uh, you know, old type mobile home camper type units that are completely in various stages of destruction. They're not inhabitable and that's typically why the sheriff's office will recommend abatement. So they're not pieces of construction equipment that actually have value and that kind of thing, I would assume? Not based on any of the uh, pictures or information that I've seen. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions of the speaker? Okay, thank you. Thank you, board. Is there any desire to hear from the sheriff's office on this? Madam Chair, I believe um, Treasurer Cox may be on the line. Oh, yeah. there she I did is. hear a little voice. Treasurer Cox, would you like to say something? Uh, I 
would like to just say that we have been working, Luke, myself, and um, the sheriff's office have been working together. <clears throat> we have a plan in place that once all of the current in Six City uh, for black or and that we are going to get you to it and talk about how we can better, how the sheriff can better have procedures in place because I do not know what their procedures are. We couldn't get necessarily written procedures and the person, the panel after the delinquent tax person is out for at least a month. So it's really been a problem to get information from them and just so you know, especially Supervisor Tuss, but as we are going to be working toward the procedures moving this forward in a quicker manner. Um, we provide them with all the documents and to them to move forward on, on whatever they feel is the most important thing. We're going to talk about how that can best be resolved. Okay, Treasurer Cox, I couldn't hear or understand very much of what you said, but there's two gentlemen at the podium from the Sheriff's Office, and maybe they can translate uh, your words better than what I heard. Perfection. Sheriff Schuster, could, could you understand what the Treasurer was, was uh, saying? Good morning, Chairman Bishop, members of the board. Not really, uh, pretty broken out there. I can tell you this has been an ongoing issue and it's not for lack of diligence. We have a civil department that uh, tries to expedite all of the tax liens that we can do and Supervisor Gould, you're, you're spot on when you, you point out some of these properties, especially the ones that are going back three years, five years, 17 years, they are so so much disrepair that they have zero value. So we can certainly still try to sell these properties, but at the end of the day, the costs uh, that, that will be uh, associated to the county in regard or in reference to the return from the sale does not seem to be equitable if uh, it, it's to be abated. And, and we've requested abatements uh, for many years. And so some of these older ones, I question why they're still in the tax roll. I can't speak specifically, but I know that if we have a property that in, in our opinion, and we take photos and we document the, everything that we're doing, if it has no value, per se, we will request abatement to get it off the tax roll. So uh, what I would like to do though, because I'm sure you do have some questions, I brought my chief civil deputy with me. He's much more well versed in uh, what we do on a daily basis. So if you have any questions, uh, Sergeant Ryan Bridges is here to answer those questions. Okay, good morning, Sergeant. Put good you morning. On the spot. It's all right, good morning. Did, did anybody have any specific questions? Um, would you like an overview of kind of how I, we? I would like to just know how how your procedures are, how how you go forward uh, when, uh, when you get notice of, of well, these properties. Once once the treasurer sends us the delinquent tax notices and they're mailed out, um, if they don't respond, which a majority of them do, like uh, it was mentioned earlier, about 55 percent uh, of the taxes were were just collected through uh, the people getting the notices and such. Um, from that point, once they don't pay the taxes, we, we have, I have two civil deputies that do uh, civil service, Title 36 pickups, and as well as trying to hunt down these uh, properties for, for seizure, if we can. Um, they go out, they take pictures, they're trying to identify the owners. Um, a lot of times we find where the, the previous owner's deceased and now someone new has a property. It, it's a very complicated process once we go to the seizure part. Um, identifying the new owners and identifying um, the properties that are that are that we feel are eligible that aren't um, uninhabitable or just um, a lot of these are have been stripped from the wire and the siding. Um, looking at a majority of them, uh, they're uninhabitable and. Then that coupled with the county ordinance of not being able to reset uh, a mobile that's from 1976 or newer. A lot of these are like, I have a 1955 champion that we're looking at right now. And one, it's uninhabitable. And two, nobody would buy that trailer to move it somewhere else because they can't because- I'd love the, the conference. Ordinance. 
So uh, we're trying our best. We're, we're going out and trying to identify these as best we can. Um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do better with the treasurer's office is identify these ones that are not and, and abate them because they have stayed on the tax roll for a long time and we need to get those off the tax roll. And we're trying to get them the, the documentation that they need to do that. So, but going to forward to sale, uh, in the, about the last two months, we've looked at 40 different properties. Out of those 40, we're identifying like two right now that we're gonna seize and put up for sale um, that are in a condition that would be equitable for the county to, for someone to purchase this, pay off the tax liens, and then we would get our, 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 our tax money out of it that way. But f two out of 40 is not a great return. I mean, it's just kind of one of those things where these are older mobiles and they're, they're hard to, to sell. Okay, thank you. One other thing I would like. Sheriff Schuster, to go ahead. One other thing I would like to point out, we always look at the high dollar uh, tax liens first and we work our way down. I would say over 70% of the list we received this year were very small dollar amounts, $25, $40. So we're focused on collecting those that are going year after year after year. And those are the ones we need off the books. And we always strive to do better. You know, we've reached out to a lot of the counties. How are they doing their process? Or if, if we're failing, we want to correct it. But I know that the uh, civil division works very hard, not just on delinquent taxes, but on all matters associated with their responsibility. So we are going to meet with uh, the county treasurer and the assessor, see if we can't yet come up with a better plan. I actually believe this was resolved two years ago when uh, Supervisor Johnson first brought this up. So, uh, you know, it's something that's in the works still and we're gonna continue to do everything in our power to, to do our mandated responsibility, but we're gonna seek to solidify with the other county entities to make sure we're, we're all in agreement. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Johnson, do you have any questions for the sheriff? about the sheriff, maybe the sergeant, but I guess my concern is when they're first due on the first year and they're overdue, it seems to me that would be the time that we would seize these because as they go on and on, obviously, then you could get, unless they're bought by somebody, you could get squatters or the people stealing all this stuff. Maybe between you and the treasurer, you can come up with a plan to bring back to us. If we have to abate some, then we're going to have to abate a lot just to get them off the tax roll so we can get down to where nobody's over a year. We just go right in and take the property and seize it. Because the longer it goes, I'm guessing the worse the property condition is going to be. Supervisor Johnson, I think that's an excellent point. That is something we can do. Uh, so yes, we will get with the treasurer and return to the board with an adequate solution. Madam Chairman. Supervisor Gold. I know Attorney Esplin might know the answer to this. If we seize the real property, do we also, or do we see, if we're seizing the personal property, are we then seizing the real property also? I don't think so. I don't think we're seizing real property. It's, yeah, it's no, all not. personal property we're talking about. Yeah. And I think state law prohibits us from going after the real property to, for the debt of the abatement of the personal property. Yeah, I don't see that we can go after the real property. The real, the, it's going to be just personal property. You seize the property for which the tax was owed. Sure. So if, as long as they were paying their, their real property taxes, then you can't seize the real property. Correct. There's a different procedure. And I wouldn't them. think that uh, these are falling under the homestead exemption because I doubt people are even living in them, so that they can't really be their primary residence. Madam Chair, could I seek clarification? Yes. When we're dealing with properties that are uninhabitable and dilapidated and we're looking to get them off the tax roll, uh, can we look at our sheriff's substations as well when we do this? That's a joke. <laughs> Not really, but that. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all smiling. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other questions for the sheriff? Any supervisor? Thank you. Have a great Monday. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll entertain a motion or not. Uh, Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. 
I don't know that we need a motion, the sheriff and the treasurer, that they'd get together and bring us back a plan. So if they follow up with that, sounds good to me. All right, sounds good to me. So there'll be no action taken on that item. We'll move on to item number 66. This is under uh, the county manager's name. Speed discussion of possible action to approve the modified tenant improvement capital project to re remodel part of the community service department area at the Mojave County Central Complex in Lake Havasu City to the design and construct approximately 656 square foot of office space for Mojave County Supervisor District 5. Mr. Hendricks. Madam Chairman, um, this project was originally um, slated for $76,300 and we were looking at remodeling a uh, garage portion of the Lake Havasu Central County Complex. We went out to bid for that uh, project. Uh, we actually had it designed and it came in um, at a tremendous cost. And uh, in discussion with uh, uh, Supervisor Gould, we believe that there was a better al alternative to that project and a, a more cost-effective alternative. What we looked at is an area in the Lake Havasu Central County Complex that uh, the um, developments uh, that uh, Dave Wolf's people uh, actually occupy and utilize, but they don't. It's not utilized very, very much, and he's agreed that it's not necessary for his operation. So. Uh, had facilities look at it. Uh, we believe that it could be done for uh, a reasonable cost and a cost effective, uh, become a cost effective project. We worked with Supervisor Gould on this and he um, took a look at this, this particular solution and he agreed that he would like to move forward with it. So that's why we agendized it for the board's consideration. I would like for you to all to be aware, however, that uh, Supervisor Johnson does have an item on the agenda to to uh, uh, that that could impact this project uh, by extending the uh, moratorium on vertical construction. What we would hope that the board does is make this an exception and allow us go, to go forward with this project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Any questions for County Manager? Supervisor Angus. Oh, I don't have a question. Oh, I thought you turned on your mic. Sorry, you I had a question. question. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll... Uh, Look for a motion then. Um, Chairman Bishop, I make a motion that we approve item 66. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Going on to item 67. It's be setting as the Board of Directors for the Mojave County Television Improvement District. Discussion and action reference a report on progress made in identifying and mapping the unserved areas of the county by the Mojave County Television Improvement District. We do have uh, Mr. Jack Trahan that is here um, available and Miss um, Yvonne Orr. Good morning, Yvonne. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. As you recall, this item was brought before the board on February 18th meeting. Uh, with the board directing staff to come back within 60 days regarding an update on tax but unserved areas of the county. Uh, and with the cancellation of the second meeting in April, we're a little further out than 60 days, but we move this to the May 4th meeting. Just to cover a few of the steps that we've taken during this time, um, WECOM prepared some maps which were shared with GIS staff and the IT department to determine if they could be overlaid on our GIS mapping system. The maps in their current format are static images of map data. It would be very time consuming to digitize these maps into a GIS data format. Map images are in a very low resolution and in some areas the data is not legible. We also reached out to Bob Dutrell, who's the engineer that does the majority of the district's work. Uh, to determine if the studies he performed when we were doing the repackaging project could be converted into a GIS data format. Unfortunately, his records also from prior work for the county are not, would not be usable in a GIS format. Um, Bob continues to work with WECOM to find a better solution to address the request of the board. 
uh, and is exploring a couple of objects, a couple of options, one of them getting full maps utilizing census blocks as a starting point. Uh, however, this cost is estimated to be between five and ten thousand dollars. The maps that uh, were put in front of your chairs today, uh, we we come prepared using sites. You'll see in the three major cities like Havasu, Bullhead, and Kingman that there are approximately three maps per site. The smaller remote sites, there's a single map. Also at that meeting in February. <clears throat> Excuse me. We address some of the solutions that could be explored to to address those unserved areas in the county. Um, some of those costs, I'll just go through them again. We would we would have to look at in order to improve the service in those underserved areas. They would require site acquisition. Site acquisition. Excuse me. Possibly road work to the site, power to the site, FCC filing and and issuance of a microwave license, an engineering study. Equipment materials, uh, tower or pole depending on location of site, monthly rental fee if an existing site is available, and also labor for the installation, getting things up and operational. There's numerous unknowns there uh, when dealing with the various areas that are unserved in the county. So, right now, early estimations to get Service to an unserved area is in the range of eighty-five to two hundred thousand dollars per location. Hmm. Okay, Supervisor Gold, uh, do you have any questions? I see a lot of red on the maps. <laughs> there is yes. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions for Ms. Orr? Thank you very much. Does anybody want to hear from Mr. Trahan, who's in the audience? Yeah, I got a question for, and I don't know if it's for Yvonne or Mr. Trahan. So these maps are created how? Hi, my name is Jack Trahan with WECOM. Um, these maps were generated at our office by uh, some of our employees, Ken being one of them. And uh, there are a lot of red on those maps, but there's also a lot of jackrabbits in Arizona, I mean in Mojave County. So a lot of that red is over areas where really there's not a lot of population. Um, I think it was red. Yeah. There's different colors. I forget what the colors yeah, are. Yeah, it looks like gr green looks like the, the best signal and then yeah, yeah. Uh, goes to red being yeah. so, the least uh, signal. Anyway, basically what we found out was uh, to serve uh, kind of what you'd call an unserved area or areas that people actually have to put up antennas like 30, 40 foot in the air to get the signal. Uh, that speaking of South Lake Havasu City, um, we can we can take care of an area like that uh, with not a whole lot of work, but it will take some money to do that. And um, like Yvonne was saying, we have to maybe put in a little microwave shot across town and go to another hill and uh, either use an existing facility or something to put the signal out again. So that's kind of what we had in mind. And if you have any technical questions, uh, I have Ken here that can answer you. On, on those. Yeah, I don't really have any technical questions because I don't even know how an antenna works, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically. I see a lot of red in the Bullhead City area also, so. Yeah, there's some, there's, there's definitely some red stuff. Now, even because these maps are shadowed and they say that there may not be any signal, it actually takes uh, a trip out there with a piece of equipment or even just a television set and an antenna to ensure either there is signal or there's not signal. Uh, even though these things are engineering studies, they're not what I'd consider 100% accurate. Sure. sure. Thank you, sir. Madam yes, Chairman. Sir. Yes, Mr. Hendricks. I, I do think this is a, a, a very relevant topic and, uh, you know, 
that uh, um, the board can make some decisions on during the budget process because uh, uh, currently our TV districts are, are uh, not adequately funded uh, or under, underfunded. Our TV district is underfunded to be able to look at uh, projects to expand our service areas. I think that's, that's a given, is that correct? So uh, um, if the board wanted to prioritize trying to expand services into uh, certain areas, they would have to look at uh, what, those, what that expansion might cost. You know, how many areas are we gonna expand to? And then take a look at the funding and the assessment. And during this budget process, uh, approve uh, uh, some level of funding which would allow us to either phase in these improvements or, or accomplish them in a short period of time. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I'd just like to say I hope you all stay healthy. And this is kind of a weird way of doing things the way I had to do it today, but uh, we're, we're trying to help as best we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Trahan. Okay, does anyone want to make a motion to accept this report? I'll make a motion to accept this report. <clears throat> and thank Mr. Trahan for all his diligence and work in putting this together. I think it's, uh, it's only fair for people that, that purchase property in these areas that are not covered that uh, Mojave County just simply cannot cover the entirety of Mojave County. Uh, the, it'd be impossible uh, to do that. And, and in many cases, those folks that are purchasing property out in those areas can't even get cell coverage. So I think a person that's gonna be living in those areas needs to accept the fact that there's gonna be limited services available. But with that, I do make the motion to accept it. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Trahan. Okay, we have thank a motion guys. and a second. Any further comments? Supervisor Johnson, did I hear you chime in? No, ma'am. <clears throat> okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. We'll go on now to an item brought to us by Supervisor Johnson. Item number 68, a discussion on possible action in continued response to the COVID-19 pandemic continue the following changes to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors regular meetings through the end of June. Changes include changing the regular meeting to once a month, first Monday, and change the call to the public to that of written dialogue to be received by the clerk of the board no later than Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. prior to the board meeting, and furthermore, have those meetings be held here at the Mojave County Auditorium in Kingman. Okay, Supervisor Johnson. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. I don't think there's any need for me to discuss anymore. I think it's something that we should probably extend for the one month period. And I would make a motion to that effect. Second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Aye. Aye. I opposed it. Okay, motion carries four to one. <clears throat> Item number 69, be a discussion on possible action Ray, due to the current market turmoil and unknown budget restraints related to COVID-19. It is in the best interest of Mojave County taxpayers to continue the hiring freeze of any non-essential new hires for an additional 30 days. See, Madam Chair. Johnson. Go ahead. Thank you. I don't, I don't know that we need a motion on this. I think the county manager and the department heads are following this procedure anyway. Okay. Going on then to item number 70, discussion of possible action, Ray, due to the current market turmoil and unknown budget restraints related to COVID-19. It's in the best interest of our county taxpayers to extend the delay of all vertical projects that are not currently under contract for an additional 30 days with the exception of the Bullhead City project and parking lots. 
So again, this is Madam Chair. This is your item, Supervisor Johnson. Go ahead. Uh, once again, I don't think that we need to continue this. I think the manager and all department heads are taking care of this. Okay, we did have a, a little discussion there on item number 66 in regards to the construction of the District 5 Supervisor Office in Lake Havasu. So is there any interest? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, I, I think that any projects brought forward, the board will have the ability to go ahead and pursue them similar to that item. Okay, so we'll take no action on this item. Okay, going on under Supervisor Gold's name, have item 71. This will be a discussion of possible action to terminate the park development agreement and the 2018 amendment with Mojave Valley Fort Mojave Community Park Committee, a nonprofit organization in favor of allowing MVD to continue to hold the donation lease agreement with Cheryl Ventures to operate, maintain, improve, and use the park for the benefit of the community with the county's participation being a five-year funding only commitment in the amount of 50,000 per year to MVP. This will be for a term of five years and a subsequent renewal term for the purpose of offsetting the park maintaining and operating costs. I do have one person that would like to speak on this item, Mr. Dan. Dan Ayler, and then we have Mehdi Arzami. Okay, who wants to go first? Okay, we have Mr. Mehdi Arzami heading to the podium. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just here if there's any question. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Rosami? I, I do. Supervisor Angus. Hello, how Good are you morning. doing? All right, so um, back in 2015, I believe, we, we approved this and in the, in the contract, the River Valley High School, part of the crushed school district, they, um, they were obligated to pay for the maintenance of the park. And then I believe two years later, we, they came back and confirmed that and said they were going to honor it. So what happened? Are they still involved? Um, yes, ma'am, uh, they are they're involved, uh, but the size of the park is, as you know, is like very large. And, uh, you know, for example, they have a dog park, which is the largest in the state of Arizona, and it's not related to, uh, you know, the school system. So they are still taking care of that. They have a company that takes care of their maintenance, ABM, and they are uh, heavily involved right now. Uh, if you look at the park, it's being maintained all the time. But there are a lot of uh, additional things that happens during the park that to uh, other groups, I gave you a list. I don't know if you have that long list of the different groups that are using. And uh, we feel that you know they, it's not fair to say 100% of the expenses of other groups goes also to the school. So we still uh, you know, need to participate and we are participating with the volunteers that we have to support the park because it requires a little bit more than what uh, you know, the school system is using it for. Okay, so at the time, Riley Fry, who was the super, his name is on that. So he's gone and there's a new board. Can we get verification and we can get them uh, to make sure that they are on board? I mean, I would hate to be surprised. They after did this. that. Uh, if you look at the list after the Riley Fry was left, uh, there was a question because we were going to do a playground uh, with the help of Legacy Foundation, which is the strongest. Uh, 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 community uh, uh, support that we have. And one of the requirements was, you know, to get the new board post uh, Riley Fry and the new uh, superintendent to review and approve it. And we have that one and we approve, they approved it again. Do you know how much they 
put into it, how much they pay out of their budget? It is basically, it's not a dollar a month, it is the service because they delegate it to ABM, which maintains all the soccer fields, football fields of the, all the schools in high schools that they have, like Mojave High School and River Valley High School. They have contract with ABM, and ABM is basically provide the service. So there was no dollar a month, but providing the service. Okay. And, and what is the what is the requirements for this service? Like who oversees it, makes sure that it, it is done? Um, and how does ABM know exactly what they're required to do? Uh, uh, the community that we have, the board that we have, including myself, Chip Sherrill, and other members uh, that we have, about six or seven of us on the board, we constantly monitor that. And at the same time, uh, you know, the uh, supervisor that they have for ABM, his, his name is Juan, and he also um, monitors that as well. And what exactly is the 50,000? Is it for maintenance only, or would it go to uh, capital improvements? No, no, no. The improvements are all being done by the community. This is only for the maintenance. The park is huge. I mean, you've been there uh, 39 acres, and uh, definitely it requires a lot. There's a lot of um, uh, repairs that is going to be done. Uh, and again, for example, uh, at this time, I'm sure you know, uh, weeds are the problem, you know, one of the major problems we have because of the rain we had in 2019, they're growing much faster than any other, uh, you know, uh, plant material. And that's, that's what basically, uh, you know, needs to be, uh, there's a lot of little details that needs to be done in the park and we basically use uh, ABM as well as, uh, you know, community support to take care of it. It's not for any capital improvement. And we'll get a um, printout of what it's used for? I mean, will we get, will there be any kind of way we can make sure of that? Yeah, you, you have, uh, you know, the, the list of the items that, you know, I gave you. I don't know if you have that copy of the, all the different functions that is going in. And, uh, you know, all those uh, right after, for example, Easter Acon, which unfortunately this year, because of the coronavirus, it was canceled. Uh, we, have, we anticipated 3,000 uh, kids enjoying themselves over there. And we had over 35,000 eggs, which are right now in, right. in my storage. Yes. <laughs> It's a lot of eggs. All right, I have a question for uh, Mike Hendricks, but I'll wait until the board is sure. done here. Uh, Chairman Bishop, if I could just interject just to answer Supervisor uh, Angus's question there. Yes. As part of this agreement in the backup, it points out that MVP shall provide to Mojave County no later than May, th than May 31st of each year a report on the operation and activities being conducted at the park and also a report as to how the funding provided by Mojave County was spent, including written backup to verify purchases. So that's in the agreement that, that's been contemplated. I wanted to, on the record here. Okay. <clears throat> All right, anyone else have questions for Mr. Arzami? Okay. Thank, thank you. you for providing us with this information. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, Mr. Ayler. Would you like to make a comment? Madam Chairman, uh, members of the board, staff, uh, Dan Ayler, I'm here um, on behalf of the BHHS Legacy Foundation. Um, our foundation has been very supportive of this project as we are with many park projects uh, in multiple different locations uh, here in Mojave County. Our, our actual thrust, of course, uh, spreads principally to uh, uh, Ms. Angus's uh, district, uh, Bullhead City, uh, where we have expended something in the range of just shy of $13 million over the last uh, years. Um, while, while that is the primary scope, uh, we certainly have um, done a, a multitude of things for uh, virtually every, every supervisorial district uh, here in Mojave County. For instance, with Mojave Community College, we have uh, issued scholarships uh, 
of a million two hundred fifty-eight thousand eight hundred and seventy-five dollars uh, to the college, um, not only for equipment and supplies but capital funding. Uh, we have contributed about three point three million dollars. So certainly that has value to the entirety of every one of your supervisorial districts. Uh, in Mojave Valley, we're just shy of a million dollars. Um, we have an outstanding um, authorized grant of uh, $250,000 for Mojave Valley Community Park. Uh, but one of the criteria that is of utmost importance to the foundation is that to those entities that we issue grants, uh, uh, perhaps the most important element uh, is that we are convinced of the sustainability of those projects. Um, we made a fairly sizable grant at the outset of Mojave Valley Community Park. Um, our, our basis at the time from a sustainability standpoint was the school district commitment. But since then, this particular project has grown, you know, I would estimate three, maybe four magnitudes of what it was at that point in time. We're desirous of contributing another, and we have committed another quarter of a million dollars uh, to further capital improvements in that project. But it is contingent upon, as I have indicated on several occasions before this board, um, our board being convinced that it is a sustainable project. And I don't think rightfully we can look exclusively at the school district to, to, to maintain that. May I go for yes, another moment or two? Continue. Um, one, one of the things, for instance, that have occurred is we have developed an extremely strong relationship with the Fiesta Bowl Foundation. As a result of that um, relationship, uh, we were able to uh, obtain a, a Kaboom Park that is now in existence. And I think, uh, Supervisor Gould, you were, I think, present uh, at, that, at that dedication. Uh, similarly, uh, there are a multitude of other projects that have come about because of the relationship with the Legacy Foundation. And while um, more recently uh, we have just acquired a parcel, 8.8 .8 acres of ground, again down in Supervisors Gould District and, and Mojave Mesa, uh, for a establishment of a new Boys and Girls Club. And we have already secured a commitment again from the Kaboom Park people, as well as uh, the Fiesta Bowl Foundation to build a football field as we did in Bullhead City. That will happen as a result of a donation uh, from the Fiesta Bowl Foundation from the 2021 Cheez-Its Bowl. Uh, simultaneous with that, um, a new Kaboom Park on the Mesa. But we can, and they will be supported by and uh, maintained by, from a sustainability standpoint, the, the Boys and Girls Club. Um, but I cannot overemphasize to you how important it is to us um, that there is a sustainability component and an acceptable one. Now, Mojave Valley, since I was the chairman of the Mojave County Parks Commission back in, before most of you were probably born, um, <laughs> you know, we were never able to get a park down in Mojave Valley. We were never able to get the land uh, contribution. And while we started, in effect, Sarah Park in Havasu, um, a couple of parks, uh, Madam Chairman, in, in, in your districts, Olivet Small, um, those facilities were originally built, if you would, by capital out of the Mojave County Park Fund. And I see no reason why, uh, simply because we're 50 years or 40 years past that, that there shouldn't be a contribution for maintenance. I don't think there's ever been, well, other than the original one, re a request as far as capital improvements, and that is not what I understand this motion to be. But we as the foundation 
require sustainability of the dollars and the facilities that we generate. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Ayler. I appreciate very much your, your um, approval or potential approval of this project. If you've got any questions, I'd be very, very happy to attempt at least to answer them. And I can go through a litany list that we prepared over the weekend of projects here in Kingman, uh, Supervisor Watson, that, that we have funded, I think they total right at $240,000. Similarly, Madam Chairman, we have at least provided funding for one of the projects up in your area, up in Oatman. So uh, I, I think we attempt to spread our wealth, if you would, and certainly our dedication to the public uh, and to the residents and citizens of our county. I, okay, I have a difficult you. time shutting up. I, I apologize. Uh, if you've got any questions. You've, you've gone over your three minutes. <laughs> thank, thank you. Madam Chairman. Supervisor Watson. I'd like to make a motion to uh, terminate the original agreement and uh, and in favor of allowing the new uh, donation lease agreement uh, in the amount of $50,000 per year for five years. And I'd like to explain a little bit my position. A uh, number of years ago, uh, Supervisor Moss brought to us uh, the uh, proposal for a park in Mojave Valley and was requesting $250,000. At that point, the position was, it, uh, and that was the position that I accepted at the time, that that would be the only dollars funded for that. Uh, in the course of the number of years that have times <coughs> elapsed, that project has grown three and four fold. And now it's in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 acres of a park in the area, and I believe it uh, behooves us to to make sure that those uh, investments by the people in that area are covered with a sustainable <coughs> sustainable $50,000 a year. With that, I move for acceptance. Okay, thank Chair you for, for that. Chairman motion. Bishop, uh, can I ask can I ask a, a Supervisor Watson to just add to his motion? to also authorize the chairman to sign the park funding agreement that's in the backup as amended thank you okay i wanted to uh make a comment because uh, most of the community parks are in my district and uh, parks are a quality of life issue even in the remote areas of mojave county so um, um Davis campus has received some significant improvements over over the past couple of years and so has wallapai mountain park uh, just recently, other than just regular maintenance, Golden Valley Park has finally received some very nice improvements. We have a, a playground there for the children and a promise of sidewalks and some grass and uh, a watering system. So um, I will support this motion, Supervisor Watson, but I also want to make sure that we don't forget the community parks in Mojave County. There's a five-year community park plan that's in existence and the the next community park to get some significant improvements is the north kingman park in the um, uh, neil neil butler park specifically and then i think the the smaller community parks are in in line to just get some some maintenance and a few minor improvements but i would i just want to make sure that if we approve this agreement that the community parks in district four are not forgotten about and they go forward so with that, we need a second. So. Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. Oh, I'll wait for a second. Second. Okay, we have a second from Supervisor Gold. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know, hopefully our parks director is there, can answer some question. I believe we all received the photos of the shape of the park, which is obviously not being maintained right now. We also saw that the park is closed while all other parks in the state have remained open. We've had nothing but problems since the beginning of this park with getting the association to keep up their end of it. There was never anything that we were going to maintain the park, as Supervisor Angus said. The original agreement has just been basically thrown out and not followed. Uh, is the parks director there? He is not Madam, here. Madam Chairman, um, 
Mr. Hendricks, if, go ahead. Uh, you all recall, Steve Latosky went down there about a, a week and a half ago after the rains, and there was some, uh, uh, he had some pictures of some uh, weeds. I, I was curious myself, I went down there Wednesday, and uh, the park was actually very immaculately maintained. Um, uh, the uh, uh, playground area um, in question, not having ADA access, I was curious about that. I'm not that familiar with what ADA access is required. So I, I broached that with uh, um, the LLC and, and they informed me that uh, the ADA portion of the, that playground hasn't been constructed yet, but it's planned. So uh, that was gonna be taken care of. The parking lot looked great. Um, I've got pictures for on my phone that I took. I apologize for not sharing them with the board. I, I wish I would have now. I didn't think it was going to be an issue, but uh, it exceeded my expectations when I went down there to take a look at it, and I commend um, whoever is maintaining it. I don't know who's maintaining it now, but there was quite a bit of effort uh, that had been uh, that had gone into it from the uh, previous pictures that were shown. But I, I attribute the previous pictures to it, it rained. Uh, that doesn't happen here very often. <laughs> so uh, uh, that grows weeds and, and uh, it wasn't like the uh, park looked like it was a mess or awry or, or not maintained. It just looked like there was some weeds growing out there. They're not anymore. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. I realize that the valley manager is an engineer, but uh, you have some rain and a weed grows, it doesn't grow up to two foot overnight. It, it takes a while, so I'm guessing that the maintenance hadn't been done until this item came up and and we had gotten the picture from Mr. Lutowski. Uh, as the park manager is not here, our director, Mr. Hendricks, don't we have quite a few projects in the wall pies that need to be done, that are mandatory to be done with water systems, et cetera? Uh, yeah, one of them was uh, Davis Camp. We just funded a half a million dollars, $530,000 at Davis. I believe all the projects uh, um, up in, there are considerable amounts of projects up in the wall pies. Um, we just spent 70, plus thousand dollars out in Golden Valley for their uh, playground equipment with the promise of the um, um, with the pro with the promise of the uh, sidewalks I think there's twenty five thousand dollars proposed this year or will be proposed this year for Neil Butler Park uh, so there is a great need uh, the fund parks fund was setting I believe was somewhere north of one million dollar cash on hand until this uh, half a million dollar project was uh, proposed. According to Steve Latosky, he wants to see uh, for a rainy day and for uh, continued operation about 400,000 a year, which uh, I broached with him regarding this 50,000. We earmarked some uh, funds this year just in case the board was gonna move in this direction um, for uh, the Mojave Valley Park. And Steve uh, assured me Steve Latosky, the Public Works Director, assured me that uh, um, this 50000 would be able to be funded and would have a great impact on, on uh, the rest of the park operations. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, the money that will be taken, the $50,000, will come from revenues generated by the Wallapai Park? Uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, uh, Supervisor Johnson, it's... My understanding, the 50,000 will come from revenues generated by both Wallapai and Davis Camp. Those are, are uh, f for free, for fee uh, operations. I would suggest that we take a look and have the attorney look at the contract with the Bureau of Reclamation. I believe that Davis Camp is similar to what Sarah Park was, that no funds or all funds that are generated by Davis Camp must be spent on the improvement or the running of Davis Camp. And I think we're getting dangerously low on taking money from the Wallapies 
and cannot afford to be taking fifty thousand dollars a year to donate to a park in another area. Okay. Any other discussion, I, Supervisor I, Angus? I miss. I didn't hear the end of what you said. Did you say it would be grave? problem to take the money or not a grave problem? I, I didn't understand what you said at the end of your comment. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Madam Chairman, Supervisor Angus, it's my understanding that uh, the 50,000, uh, the, the park system um, would be able to absorb the 50,000 being proposed and it wouldn't cause grave concern. Wouldn't, okay, thanks. And I don't know if I Madam, use the word grave concern. It wouldn't, it wouldn't cause concern. It would be able to be funded. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would say that we need to look if the money will only come from the wallifies that we can sustain that. I believe that the money from Davis Camp must remain at Davis Camp. Now, uh, Madam Chairman? Yes, County Manager. Uh, Supervisor yes. Johnson, uh, I'm not familiar with that, and, and you, you raise a good point, but I, I, I want to also raise a point that uh, Wallapai Mountain Park operated in the red for years and years and years and years, and it wasn't until recently that Wallapai Mountain Park started operating in the black. So, ever since uh, ever since I can remember, up until recently, Wallapai Mountain Park had been subsidized by funds uh, collected in Davis Camp. So, I, I I'm not saying that it doesn't need to be looked at. It's just something that uh, historically. We've utilized Davis in the past to fund our, all of our park system, including all of our uh, 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 community parks. And uh, that's, that's the way we've, we've operated. Wallapai has only recently been operating, you know, within the, well, recently only been operating in the black. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, Mr. Hendricks, with his admission to us taking money from Davis Camp, is no way a record of the Board of Supervisors. But I think we should look at, in, in all honesty, look at the contract with Davis Camp if we're going to be extending money to a private organization from revenues collected from Davis Camp before we submit any money. Okay, thank you. Mr. Eskman, uh, do you have any comments? I don't know the history of the uh, Davis Camp uh, lease with, from the BLM. I'd have to look into it. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And, and that would be National Park Service or uh, the BOR. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Motions. Got a motion. Madam Chair, we have a, a, a motion and a second already. Thank you for that. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Item number 72. This is under Ken Cunningham, our human resource director's name. Be a discussion and action. Ray approve the recommendation of the county manager selection committee to appoint Tara Acton as the Mojave County Procurement Director. Does anyone have any questions of uh, Mr. Cunningham? No, I have just motion to approve. Second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Going on to item 73. This is under Development Services Director Tim Walsh. Discussion and action to grant a utility easement to Unisource Services in order to place and maintain power infrastructure required to service Surbat Landfill and authorize the Chairman of the Board of Supervisors to sign the easement. And this so, does require a unanimous vote of the Board. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous approval of the board. Going on to item 74, discussion and action. Ray adoption of the Board of Supervisors resolution number 2020-075. Acceptum, acceptance of as built plans and approval of a final release of all remaining assurances for the completion and improvements for Surbat Vista track 3067-C. We do have the applicant present if anybody has any questions. Madam Chairman, I move that we adopt board resolution 2020-075. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> motion passes. The next item is under the uh, procurement director, Michelle Fink, setting as the board of directors for the Golden Valley Improvement District number one. It's be a discussion and action to approve the use of Mojave County Job Order 19PS22-04, well maintenance with Weber Water Resources out of Chandler, Arizona for specialized well development work required on the previously drilled but undeveloped Golden Valley Improvement Water System wells number three and four. In addition, staff request a project contingency fund allowance of 5% in the amount of $5,676 and change for Mojave County authorized essential work to address any unforeseen conditions and or enable project completion. Funds for this project totaling $119,207.55 will be sourced to fiscal year 20 adopted budget for Wells 3 and 4 rehabilitation. Okay. Madam Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion for the approval of Mojave County Job Order Number 19 PS 22-04, the uh, <coughs> job order contract well maintenance for Weber Resources. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Item 76, discussion of possible action. Ray, approve and sign amendment number two to contract number 18-P-05, armed on armed security guard services to US security associates doing business as advanced security, Phoenix, Arizona, modifying the contract to add the COVID-19 quarantine site location. Okay, I'll entertain a motion or a discussion. Madam Chairman. Supervisor Gold. Move that item 76 be adopted. <clears throat> I'll second the motion. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next item 77. Let's be a discussion and action to approve and sign amendment one to contract 20 P 01 Mojave Valley Landfill Gas Remediation Construction with. SCS Engineers of Long Beach, California, authorizing change order number one. Further approve a project contingency budget of 10% for the total construction project price, bringing the new total project budget to $750,715.68. I'll entertain a motion or discussion. Motion to approve. Second the motion. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, going on, item 78. This is under my name. Uh, it's be a discussion <clears throat> and action for an update from the county public health director to the board of supervisors regarding recent issues, actions, events, and county responses regarding COVID-19 updates and taking any necessary actions based on the updates. Good, Good morning, morning, Madam Chair, Burley. members of the board. Just wanted to provide you with an update on some of the activities. One, and first and foremost, would be the testing activity that occurred over the weekend here in Kingman. Sonora Quest provided COVID-19 testing to approximately, well, not approximately, I have 216 patients were tested. Those are the official numbers from SonoraQuest. 
Of those, we have four positive results so far, and we are awaiting complete results. I don't know that we have them at this point. And then there were five canceled tests due to, um, apparently they were leaked in transport. So those will be, those particular patients will be retested, person or request, and then those results will be submitted to the county. So um, also to let you know that they have made us aware that there are two other testing events that will go on in our county and we can promote these out in the communities um, when we have more details. The first will be this weekend in Bullhead City. Um, and the second will be in Lake Havasu on the 16th. Um, so as soon as we have additional details on those, those will be posted on the ADHS Testing Blitz website. Additionally, we'll try to get some information a little bit earlier so that we can ensure that we get some information out to the public as well and share that. I do wanna discuss briefly the difference in numbers that we had um, over the weekend, and I wanna address that specifically. The staff, we've recognized that since about the 15th, we've seen some inaccuracies. So our staff spent a good portion of the weekend doing an audit on all of our cases, all of our numbers, day by day, using our MedSys information that we get through the state and looking at our emails and how we've reported out that information. So we did confirm and finalize that audit and we have that, that total case count. Uh, available now and we have it broken out accurately by city and we apologize for the errors. We've also developed a different process to streamline the reporting process so we have um, fewer emails going in different directions. So the right people get the right information at the right time to keep our spreadsheet and our case counts up to date. The other issue that you'll probably see on, a, on the website if you look at ADHS in Mojave County is the death numbers. ADHS currently shows, or as of yesterday, showed 15. Our Mojave County website shows 14. What we have been told is that ADHS is including a probable case in there. We only report confirmed cases. So the fact that there's a probable case, what we're researching is whether or not that person has been tested and when we, when we should receive those test results back so that we can confirm our case, or if they're going to maintain that status because they have not tested that individual, and then we need to take steps to figure out how we'll address that on our web page, because that will cause some concern, and and um, it probably already has. So, I did want to make sure that I address that with you. Um, I want to thank you all for and thank the county manager for helping us um, and approving the recruitment of a new public health emergency preparedness coordinator. Our coordinator has re resigned effective May 15th. This person has accepted another job out of state. It's a promotional opportunity and you know we wish her the best of luck. In the meantime, we are developing a plan to try to address that gap that we will have and I think we have one in place. It'll be sort of formative at this point. We'll have to kind of work with it and see um, what what gaps we still have, and then figure out how we fill those gaps. With that said, um, we'll probably be reaching out to request approval for uh, uh, to hire temporary staff to assist us with some of our uh, contact tracing efforts to make sure that we're following up on cases and monitoring. All of the expenses associated with these requests are funded through grant funds. The grant funds that you approved this afternoon or this morning related to uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis monies, those are gonna be used to pay for these expenses. So there will be no general fund dollars used to pay for those expenses. <coughs> and that's exactly what those um, funds are to be used for, is to, to address the response. Uh, uh, let's see here. Let me go through my notes and make sure I've captured everything I want to go through. Okay, I've covered sort of all the Thursday to Monday details, but I wanna be available to answer questions. So I will leave that time for you. Okay, thank you very much, Denise. Mm -hmm. uh, 
starting with Supervisor Gold. Do you have any questions? I've got some questions from my constituents that uh, go through these. A uh, question about the number of COVID cases in Mojave County. In the April 22nd BOS meeting, Denise Burley said the number of COVID cases continues to climb, but in the April, April 30th press conference, she said the curve had leveled off. This is confusing and misleading. Which is it? Good point, very good point. We do continue to see uh, cases, and they, they vary by day. Um, so we're not seeing huge increases in cases. What you see is typically five, somewhere between five and 10, which that seems like a big increase between five and 10, I realize. Um, but if you look overall at our curve, if you take out the um, numbers that are associated with long-term care facilities, it's sort of a, a level leveling out. With that said, I, I wanna keep in mind that a lot of that is due to the mitigation efforts that have taken place. So that's the stay at home orders, that's the increase in people's awareness of social, the importance of social distancing, physical distancing, washing hands, all of those preventative measures that have been discussed previously. So there's also a lot of confusion about the actual number of confirmed and presumed COVID cases. There are two different diagnosis codes to identify confirmed COVID-19 cases, U07.1 and presumed COVID-19 is U07.2. I would like to know how are these tests being coded and how many of each there are? I will look into that for you, Supervisor. Yeah, I thought that's a little hard to answer. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, are there any COVID slash pneumonia diagnosis mixed in with these confirmed cases? You know, I'm not aware of that information, honestly. I am not in the MEDSA system to be able to see sure. the medical files, et cetera, of those individuals. Okay, that's answered. Let's see. According to Abbott, formerly known as Elir, the machine comes with an initial 24 test kits because it is expected the practice would be ordering additional test kits at the time the machine is requested. I contact Elir directly and was told they are fulfilling the request of offices like our health department and first responders. Has the Mojave County Health Department ordered additional kits? And if not, why not? We have actually ordered additional kits. We have been asked to submit an order through the Arizona Department of Health Services. So that's the channel that we're following to put in our requests for additional kits. And then she's got a website that you can order from another company called Pixel also. Supervisor Gold, do you have the names on those? Because I've got call to the public um, with some of those. This is Marsha Cox. Okay. I think she's my constituent, but I believe that the the clerk distributed it to everybody. Okay, so I won't repeat those questions yeah. when, when I read the call. I'll the try to be condense them here a bit. Um, on April 27, Director Burley also said that Valley View had only one ICU bed available and Warm Sea only had four ICU beds available. But in the April 30th press conference, the G CEO of Warm Sea said he had a total of 40 ICU beds and 22 critical care beds that could be converted for ICU. ICU use. Is Director Burley trying to scare the public? No. And the board into keeping the county closed? Oh, da, 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 da. Okay, anyway. Yes, thank you for that concern. The answer is no, I'm not trying to scare anybody. Um, when we pull information from a report that's provided by hospitals, that's a piece of that report. So in talking with Mike Stenger, who's the CEO of Warm C, he stated afterwards that based on their, it, it's basically what they have available today, but they have the availability to surge into these other spaces. So what they report is based on their, their bed um, availability based on their normal situation, I guess is how you would say their normal bed count. And then they have that ability to surge beyond that uh, by opening up a different section that they have prepared for any kind of issues that they, they may have in additional cases. Thank you, and I think the rest of them are questions are actually directed towards you or the health department. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Angus. 
Thank you. I want to talk about um, the mass testing, the drive-through testing that happened this weekend. Yes. So, so when you, last week we were told that there were gonna be 500 tests. So was that from Sonora Quest, the decrease, or was p only that amount of people signed up? Well, I think it was drive-through, first come, first serve, as I understood it. Initially, there was a thought that there would be pre-registration, and I think that's why the the uh, information was removed from the, web, from the website because they had a link to pre-registration and then learned that there would be no pre-registration, so they needed to correct that. So um, I believe that it was just a result of who showed up to be tested on that day. They did have 500 test kits available okay. for testing, but at this point it looks like only 216 uh, of those kits were used. And these are people who were asymptomatic. They just wanted to know, they thought maybe they had been um, close to someone who maybe had it, but nobody came there sick. Well, I don't know that that would be the case. Okay. I think there were probably uh, people who were asymptomatic. Some people may ha have had what would be considered mild symptoms, and other people may have been sick. So all the precautionary methods were taken at the testing site to ensure that those individuals that were collecting samples and specimens were not infected. Okay, so it's, it's, it's get their skin. Now this is through ADH, this isn't through our public health department. This is all being done through ADHS? That's correct. All right, and um, in Bullhead, so again, last week I thought I either read or was told that the Kingman um, testing was going to be the only one in Mojave County, and now we're back to it's going to be in Bullhead City and in, in Havasu, correct? That and is and who, I just want to make sure that who's ever is working, because who, who, did, who was involved in the uh, Kingman? I mean, were they the first responders? Were they, did they have the police? I mean, who, who was responsible and who, uh, you know, who would pay for that? Sure. So Sonora Quest was responsible for organizing and coordinating all of the testing. ADHS did ask that we reach out to local law enforcement and fire to ensure that um, if there were issues around traffic control and other issues that might be around the testing event that they would be um, prepared or at least aware that this was going on and they could address them at that time. So Sonora Quest really and ADHS are really taking the lead on the testing events and I think it's an ever evolving situation so the organizations that are performing the testing have to have all of their own supplies. That's test kits, that's PPE. And so as a result, what you, I think there's, um, on some parts, they're not committing too quickly because they need to ensure that they have those supplies available before they can commit to the actual event. So we were, uh, we had some rumors basically around an event in Bullhead City but we didn't have any details. I think uh, Sonora Quest's information that we received this morning indicates they are planning an event, um, and I don't have a, uh, an official location at this point, but as soon as we have that information, we will be sure to share it. Okay, and again, people have to make appointments? It varies, so again, if you look, on, if you look at the website, there's some locations outside of our county that have had pre-registration links that where they've asked people to do that. Right. Um, as I understood it from this Kingman event, they removed that so it was first come first serve. I don't know if they will try to implement that for a Bullhead City or Lake Havasu event. And the results of this go to our count in Mojave County? Correct. All right, so if people show up are they asking for ID? I mean, can any, anybody can show up, right? People from Nevada, people from California. You know, I'm not sure what their process was. If they showed up, if they arrived at the event and they were from another state, they may have tested them. Those results will go back to their home state. Can you find that out for sure? Because I, I think that's kind of important. Mm -hmm, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Watson. <clears throat> None, thank you. Okay. Supervisor Johnson. While you're doing the questioning of the uh, Sonoran lab, can you ask them if the leftover tests from Kingman would be made available to Lake Havasu and Bullhead? So in case we have more people in those locations that want the test, uh, they're available. I think the probably low turnout 
might be due to lack of advertising. Mm -hmm. Like right now, we have what this Saturday, possibly in Bullhead, the next Saturday in Havasu, but we don't have a location. So it's kind of hard for the people to get there if they don't know where it's going to be. Certainly, I will be sure to ask them. Thank you. And then, then with the lack of testing, it hasn't gone up. BUI possibly we haven't had uh, the increase in numbers? Well, I think it could be in the other two communities. So looking at the, the percentage of tests performed by uh, here in the Kingman area and then looking at the number of tests performed in the other two communities, I mean, we're talking in some cases a four to five fold difference in testing and therefore the numbers could reflect that. It's hard to tell, but um, I mean, that could be one indicator, of course, that there are a greater number of cases that are just unidentified in these other communities. With the relaxation of the standards for testing, are, or should we be surprised that we don't have more tests going on? It seems to be staying rather steady with the numbers. I, so let me make sure I understand your question. You're referring to just the, the increase in testing or the lack of testing? So could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. I guess it's the lack of testing. They re released or uh, removed some of the standards to make it available to more people, right. but I see the number of tests doesn't seem to reflect that more people are getting tested, especially in Lake Aviston, Bullet area. Good point, good point. And I think for some of those communities, it's still about the number of testing supplies available at those facilities. Um, some, I know Warm Sea was, um, had purchased some testing supplies, but there were delays in receiving it. I'm not sure where Lake Havasu Regional Medical, or Havasu Regional Medical Center is in that, but I do believe um, that they have some supplies, but not similar to say to Sonora Quest, which brings to the table 500 test kits uh, for a testing event, a one day testing event. So I think the testing events themselves really are relevant here in this discussion in that they, they are addressing really the, the asymptomatic and mild symptom cases or those individuals that feel they may have been exposed. And the hospitals are in many cases addressing still people coming into their hospital. So the, the more community-based, I think, kind of um, offers us a, a better picture, if you will, of what we have in our communities when they happen. Did we ever get a number back from Lake Havasu on how many tests they have available? No, but thank you for letting, for reminding me. I will follow up with Havasu Regional. Thank you. Those are the only questions I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, we do have several questions that were emailed to the clerk of the board under the call to the public. I think Supervisor Gold covered uh, his constituents' questions coming from Marsha Cox. And Marsha, if you're watching, if there's anything that uh, we didn't cover, uh, feel free to get in contact with Supervisor Gold. So the next, uh, next request to speak form that was received is from Dave Johnson from Golden Valley. He says, or his question is, there have been no reported cases of the virus in Golden Valley. Why will you not lift the bans for business and resume operation? When will you lift the orders to shut, when will you lift the orders to shut our businesses? Thank you. I believe at this point those are based on the governor's orders um, and not a direction provided by the health department. The health department is following, as well as the county is following the governor's orders, stay at home orders. And as he determines that those orders can be loosened and those restrictions can be decreased, um, we will again follow those directions and, uh, and adhere to those guidances and, and direction of the governor. Okay, and then the, the same gentleman has a couple follow-up questions. Will you allow private clubs, organizations, and service organizations to open for club activities? Again, the, the health department is not in the position really of authorizing, if you will, or, or, or doing anything more than following the governor's order. 
and at this point we're not trying to defer our responsibility in any way or deflect, but we're in the position of following the governor's order just as everyone else is. And as that is explained by the governor, that is again what we abide by. Okay, his next question is, since the schools, libraries, and parks have been closed for the use of taxpayers and their families due to the virus, will the county give a tax relief for these services on their tax bills? And uh, so I don't believe the libraries are, are closed down or are the parks completely, um, and we don't have taxing authority over the schools. So I don't know, does anybody else have any comments on that question? Mr. Espen? Can you repeat the question? Yes, uh, he says, since the schools, libraries, and parks have been closed for the use by taxpayers and their families due to this virus, will the county give a tax relief for these services on their tax bill? I don't see that happening. Um, not that, uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a valid question, but I don't think the law will allow something like that. Okay, and then lastly, and you may want to chime in on this, Mr. Esplin, um, the Constitution gives the power of governance to local government. Will you show your support for the Constitution and your constituents of Golden Valley and return our freedom to the congregate and do business in our businesses that is guaranteed by the Constitution? Will you and the rest of the Board of Supervisors lift the governor's restrictions for our rural county? So I think the question of, of are we doing anything that's unconstitutional? Uh, I don't think that we're doing anything unconstitutional. We're following what the governor has ordered. Um, the question of what's constitutional or not is a very, very complicated question, something that courts have litigated and, and discussed and debated for hundreds of years, uh, dating back to when the Constitution was created. Um, the question of whether something is constitutional or not would be left to the court to decide. So until a court rules in and, and decides that, it, we won't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. I, I believe that's already been litigated. Um, it was what, Dickinson versus Massachusetts was a Supreme Court case in which the court upheld the authority of states to enforce compulsory vaccination laws. The court's decision was articulated that view that this freedom of the individual must sometimes be subjugated to the common welfare and is subject to the police power of the state. The primary police power function, including public health control power, is reserved to the state and the U.S. Constitution 10th Amendment. In a public health emergency, a state is well within its right to exercise restrictions in travel as part of epidemiological investigation, treatment, and social distancing. The Constitution does not import an absolute right in each person to be at all times, at all circumstances, wholly free from restraint. Instead, a community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic. Members may, at times under the pressure of great danger, be subject to such restraint to be enforced by reasonable regulations as the safety of the general public may be in demand. And I believe it's been used, I think, in the state of Pennsylvania to uphold that governor's order. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Chair. Supervisor Angus. <clears throat> to um, you know, be a little contrary to that, so our Attorney General Mark Brnovich on April 30th was put out in an AG opinion. The question presented was in reference to the right to peacefully assemble, protected under the U.S. Constitution, with attendance at a church service constitute an essential activity and be considered a permissible activity under Executive Order 2020-18. Two, would parishioners be required to maintain social distancing by being six feet apart? And three, if they are required to maintain six feet apart and do not, under what law would they be in violation of and what punishment would they be subject to? And his answer was, attendance at a church service is an essential activity under Executive Order 2020-18. The Executive Order does not impose an absolute six-foot social distancing requirement on essential services that are constitutionally protected. So I think he, you know, he got a little of both in there. Um, I think there was, I was still getting this, uh, as of yesterday, questions from churchgoers and pastors if they can open. And uh, this kind of went under the radar, radar. We didn't really see it. It wasn't in the newspapers. So I just wanted out there that if you're a church, this, this opinion, and I believe that in Arizona, 
this opinion would hold and that you can hold your church services without fear of punishment. Thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Gold. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the governor was wise in the fact that he did not order churches clo closed nor gun shops because uh, if he had done that, then he was gonna be tangling with our rights that are embedded in the Constitution. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the uh, next request to speak that was received was from Derry Lamb uh, from Golden Valley. Uh, this is just a statement. Open Golden Valley for business. Our area is open desert, but the businesses are not places where large groups gather. So that was just simply a statement. Um, the next item is from Andrea Park from Lake Havasu City. She states, I believe that we should follow the gated criteria for reopening. We do not want to rush this because people have become impatient. I do know there are guidelines, but I believe the spirit of the guidelines should be honored. We must do what is best for public health while acknowledging the burden of the economy. Reopening should be carefully data-driven, step by step. Please take a little time to do this right. It could save lives. Do you intend to support the guidelines? Okay, and I think that'll be discussed later. And then the next item um, is from Joy Bancroft out of Golden Shores. And this has nothing to do with COVID, but because I'm reading the rest of the call to the public, this one was kind of slipped over. It is about code enforcement. So um, just okay. take mm -hmm. a, a real quick break here. Are these actually called to the public or are the ones that missed the call to the public deadline? These were called to the public, but we saved them for this item because they were really related to COVID. I, are COVID we then allowed to comment on those? Okay, if I could have just addressed that, I could address that. So call to the public, we cannot address it, except if it's already on an agenda item. That's why the, the clerk of the board has placed all these to this agenda item so that we can discuss it because we already have an agenda item that specifically addresses that. Now going to this one for Joy Bancroft, if it does not address COVID-19, then this is one where we wouldn't do that. I think the clerk of the board has Actually, some Actually, Chairman Bishop, I believe in her, uh, in the page that you're getting to now, mm -hmm. she does address some things that are related to COVID-19 is why they okay. were put aside. It was, it was and, long, and, so I didn't read Right, it. I, I know her, her first page talked about code enforcement, but as you start to read her summary, it is related to this item. Good, you saved the day, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, this is a little long, so bear with me. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board of Supervisors. My name is Joy Bancroft. I live on Linden Drive in Topak or Golden Shores. In Golden Shores, we are feeling really good that we have no known cases of the coronavirus. With that being said, as a member and part of the Board of Neighborhood Watch, I come today to let you know this is very strong member base still remains vigilant and keeping our eyes and ears alert for anything that affects our community, such as drug activity, bad actors, taking advantage of properties and positive things that are keeping some freedoms alive, like our community parks open and safe within the guidelines of social distancing. I am not a new face to you for the last six months as I have come to you as a voice for cleaning up properties in our community. With this strong neighborhood watch team, we have built a network of communications that helps us all informed on what comes in, on what comes in and goes in our community. Today I come to you with a challenge. The bad element in our town are being allowed to live on properties in a motor home, accumulate more motor homes and cars to strip for money and creating compounds for their drug deals. We continue to work closely with code enforcement who has been very receptive to following up our complaints and sending out an appropriate violation notice where they can within guidelines of the code enforcement process. One such property on Cove Parkway that I have shared before that was abandoned by a squatter and bad dude who left an accumulation of motorhomes and debris has been cleaned up. This was due to the diligence of sharing at our meetings and a new owner came forward and bought the property out of foreclosure and completely cleaned it up. I will share with an email with Supervisor Gold with pictures. We have had an ongoing battle with the property on Yavapai, almost the same scenario of open lot storage issues for months. As it turned out, the property was raided and found to have a stolen vehicle on the property and red tagged, which leads to really 
bad dude who has been committing burglaries all over the county, who, by the way, is in, now in jail. The so-called owner of this property has removed the red tag, single wide mold, and has started collecting motorhomes living on the property with no water or electricity in a motorhome. Collecting motorhomes and cars and stripping, he has also created an environment where his drug buddies can come and go between other known drug properties in town. So what I am trying to get to, thank goodness, we want to nip it in the bud, these kinds of scenarios, and any means available within the law to pressure these bad guys. Code enforcement has done what they can and are pressuring the owner, who is a bad guy, with their process, but we need more, we need law enforcement. How is it that a red tag property with no running water or electricity is habitable by people living in motorhomes and allowed to stay there? Sheriff Schuster, help us out here. How is this legal that the people were removed and now are allowed to return and set up camp? When we call the Sheriff's Department for assistance because these people are living on a red tag property, we're being told that nothing can be done because the owner has been given permission for people to be there. Sheriff Schuster, you have been part of the positive results and activity in our town, but now we need the department to step up and work with county departments to stop this from happening. We now have two properties like this. The bad elements are all connected and every month the drugs come in and they help circulate it. This just happened the other night with an unknown vehicle we are jumping from property to property, now never to be seen again. So, I am asking the Board of Supervisors to enlist a better working relationship with the Sheriff's Department to work hand in hand with code enforcement so this compound scenario does not occur. This is giving the bad actors free reign to commit their drug activity and destroy properties. Supervisor Gold, I will send you the details of the properties. Thank you. Regards. Okay, any other comments, questions? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I did. <laughs> uh, thank Angus. you. Um, let's see, I had one question come in to cl for clarification. Uh -huh. So you said that this event, that 216 people were tested, five spoiled? Basically, yes. Okay. They were canceled tests as a result of some leakage of the of the product in transit, and so it, it becomes a failed test at that point. Okay, do people, and people get notified of that? They'll be told that? Yes, that exactly, they're, because so they'll- they want to get tested again? That, uh -huh, okay. exactly, yes. And four positive, mm -hmm. how many negative and pending? I, I don't have those numbers yet. I will follow up with SnorQuest as I ask those other questions as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Gold, one more. Um, Denise, are we tracking the people that uh, get get well so that we can know that say number one went on and got well and went back to, went back to work or back to their life? So to date, we have not. And there's um, some difficulty with that. First is defining what recovery looks like, for example, and I was actually looking at the Johns Hopkins database where they are reporting recovery numbers and trying to get some information about how they are reporting that. What's their definition of recovered? The easy answer would be to say, go back two weeks, right? You've got 14 days, but it's all based on their symptoms. It's all based on uh, when they got tested. It's based on uh, whether or not they were around a known contact. So there's a lot of more questions that go into trying to define that answer than just a simple this minus this equals this. So we are following up on that. I know that ADHS is also looking into putting something on their dashboard and they were having some of the same issues and questions about how to define recovered. And I don't even know that they're planning to use that term at this point. Um, so I should have more information by our Thursday meeting to share with you on what that would look like. So do we release them to go back to work? We can't officially release them in the, in the medical sense. Our nurses are unable to do that, but if they followed the conditions after monitoring, if they've proven and shown and demonstrated that they have um, no fever for 72 hours without medicine, 
and if they um, have followed the protocols and their, their uh, symptoms have always also resolved. So if they've had other symptoms, the cough, the shortness of breath, and some of the other known symptoms, if those have diminished considerably, then they can, they've followed their protocols. So we could list them as showing no symptoms? Mainly, yes. I mean, some of them may still have some symptoms, but they also may not be contagious. And this goes into the recovery piece. Of sure. Every case is an individual unique case. So to group them, you have to kind of define what that grouping should look like or how you define that. The, it seems to me that the public is looking for that. Mm -hmm. Whatever we want to call it is, you know, two weeks have passed and they didn't end up in the hospital on a ventilator. Correct. You know, and they went back to work. So if we could figure out a way to do that, I think that would be beneficial and provide peace of mind for our citizens. And we also, as we look at defining it, we want to align with the state. If they're align, you know, if they're going to be putting something on their dashboard, we don't want to confuse people by putting something different without a pretty clear explanation. We also need to make sure that we can track it and that we can provide updated numbers on a regular basis. So those are all considerations here. Thank you. Mm -hmm, certainly. Okay, any other comments? Anybody before going on to the last item of the day, 79? This is a discussion on possible action to adopt a formal letter for delivery to the governor from the Mojave County Board of Supervisors encouraging the reopening of the economy while ensuring <laughs> the public health and safety in light of COVID-19 and the public emergency. So in our last meeting, we directed staff to draft a letter to the governor for discussion purposes for the reopening of Mojave County's economy using Representative Biasucci's letter as a template, as well as incorporate other supervisors' comments during the last uh, BOS meeting. Uh, I have the letter that you all got a copy of, and uh, that's the result of that blending, and um, I guess I'll just read it. The letter states, Dear Governor Ducey, on behalf of Mojave County Supervisors, thank you for your leadership and guidance in navigating the unknowns of the COVID-19 pandemic and the measures taken to protect the health and safety of all Arizonans. Mojave County has done a tremendous job in adhering to the orders of both your office and the President of the United States. Even though we have been inundated with a substantial amount of conflicting information, while we continue to stay strong and realize we will recover, small businesses and employees throughout Mojave County continue to suffer grave economical circumstances. We are collectively writing to you today to express in the strongest terms our feelings and beliefs that this crisis on this in the strongest terms, our feelings and beliefs on this crisis and how Arizona should move forward starting immediately. We are experiencing something none of us have ever experienced before, and so we know this is new for all of us. These last few weeks have been difficult for everybody. We have lost jobs, businesses, critical funding, but more tragically, we have lost lives. Without question, one single loss of life due to COVID-19 is one life too many, and our thoughts and prayers are with each and every family that has lost a loved one. The number of cases and deaths have remained relatively low in Mojave County. Over the last few weeks, we've been able to secure more test kits for Mojave County, allowing more individuals and healthcare workers to seek testing if they feel they have symptoms of COVID-19. We know, however, that the numbers of infected are going to rise because we are testing more, and we must use common sense when looking at the numbers and consider all data to make informed decisions. You indicated in your press conference that you would be open to the option of implementing a county by county reopening process, taking into consideration the different county situations. That said, our plan will have to take into consideration the biggest difference we have with other counties, which is the weekend inundation of our Colorado River recreation areas by masses of out-of-state visitors. It should go without saying, if individuals have an underlying health condition or do not feel safe to go out in public, they can continue to stay home. If they feel sick, they can go to their doctor and get tested. They can wear a mask, wash their hands, and continue to practice social distancing. We respectfully request you respect our choice and freedoms during this crisis. It should be our right to reopen our economy if we feel we can do so safely. And if the numbers begin to rise to levels of concern, we can scale back just as quickly as we did a month ago. 
Like President Trump said, stated, the cure must not be worse than the problem. We must believe in ourselves and plan a way to reopen reasonably and begin to free ourselves from government dependence. Mojave County believes it's time to open up respectfully submitted Mojave County Board of Supervisors. So I wanted to add to this uh, letter that our state delegation um, will not be signing on to this letter because they're not quite in agreement with, with, the, with the wording. And uh, so with that, I'll open it up to discussion, starting with Supervisor Johnson. Okay, Supervisor Gold. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I continue to, uh, I don't think it was staff's place to draft a letter on the feelings of the board. Uh, the board has five members with their own distinct feelings and I just think, it, I don't think that should have been laid on staff to do that. Thanks. Okay, Supervisor Angus. Thank you. I have made a little statement. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> Last week I read a letter that was tough in its tone about the county wanting autonomy in making the decision to open up. At the time, we were made aware of the threat to take away money from state shared revenue and FEMA money. Later, I was told that if this elected board defied the governor's orders, it might put people's unemployment benefits in jeopardy. By the way, even just reading that last sentence makes me want to cry. Never thought in my life being threatened by our own state government would be something I'd be talking about, but here we are. I do not think it is necessary to send a watered-down version of what was read here last week. It's meaningless at this point. Letters like this were sent weeks ago. The governor knows how the rural counties feel, as our state representatives had done a very good job in letting him know. I won't sign off on the letter, and I don't think begging is a strategy we should employ. At this point, most things are opening. I trust our residents. I trust that business owners can make the right decisions for them and their families, their businesses, and their communities. I know that everyone will employ caution when reopening. I believe they don't need me or this board to give you, I don't believe that you need me or this board to give your, you permission to open. And I'll tell you that if I had a business, I would be open. We have the statement of our sheriff that he gave last Thursday. We have the opinion by the Arizona Attorney General that churches are allowed to open. Everywhere we look, businesses are opening. Our small business owners have been incredibly good citizens about all of this, but there's only so much they will or, sh or should take, and we're seeing that all across the country. Again, we are seeing more cases because we are testing more. Most COVID positive patients are recovering at home. Many, if not most, are connected to each other. Here in Mojave County, one third of cases and half of the deaths came from one assisted living facility. In Bullhead City, there are two zip codes and as of today, all the cases are in one zip code. The other has zero, that's mine. And with that being said, I just, again, hot off the press, got um, a notification from our state representatives that Governor Ducey is going to be holding another press conference today at three. And um, I'll tell you that he is being pressured by our state representatives and a lot of the representatives from the rural counties to let us have, again, autonomy in the decisions that are made for our counties. So that's my, that's my uh, stand on the letter, and I'll be voting no. Okay, any further discussion? A motion. Okay. Seeing no motion on the floor, the item dies and we're adjourned. <laughs>